I'm here with Amy Ricci, the Executive Director of Historic Rittenhouse Town. How are you today, Amy? I'm doing very well, thank you. So you're catching so some sun outside? Oh, it is a gorgeous day, and um, we've got lots of users here in the village today, people biking through, walking through, and just, you know, enjoying this beautiful amenity in your backyard. My wife and I have been through by it often with our dog. We've walked through there, we've hiked through there, but we've never been inside the homestead and the bakehouse. Uh, could you give us a little history on both the structures and then maybe take us inside and get a look? Yeah, absolutely. So I just want to first say you are in good company with the amount of people that have been through here and have never been in these buildings. And that is, uh, that is something that we're hoping to change. Um, so for anyone or everyone who doesn't know, historic Rittenhouse Town is the site of the first paper mill in America. Sometimes we say the British American colonies, but we can just say America. Um, I'm going to reverse my screen here just for a second and show you actually where the first mill stood. So um, right where you see that lamppost uh, mm -hmm. essentially is where the first mill stood. The first mill was built in 1690 and then after it washed out in a flash flood in about 10 years and then they rebuilt uh, by 1701 or so the second mill is there and we've actually done archaeology over there so we found the the um, foundation and some of the interior walls so again it's the Rittenhouse family so it's Wilhelm and Gertrude Rittenhouse and they emigrate over here from Holland and um, start the first paper mill here because Germantown is growing flax and flax were used for clothing so the people in Germantown were growing flax making clothing out of it when the clothing wore out, they used the clothing for rags. And then when the rags wore out, the Rittenhouse family would go along, collect the rags, sort and weigh them, and then make paper out of them. And we still make paper here on site, not out of linen flax all the time, but basically by hand the same way the Rittenhouse family did. So Wilhelm and Gertrude came over with their three children and then basically started this little complex that we call uh, Rittenhouse, Rittenhouse Town. So this is the homestead right here. Mm -hmm. And so what we're looking at is the 1707 side of the homestead. We think initially when the Rittenhouse family was here, they lived on a cat in a small cabin on site that doesn't exist. But by 1707, they're doing well enough to build this that it's referred to as a stone mansion early in the days. And then by 1730 or so, uh, the Rittenhouse family's growing. There's a lot of people living in here. So they build this addition in 1730 and then at that time they built the bakehouse as well so let's go on in so we know that this was built in 1707 because we did dendrochronology which is a way to study uh early tree rings and you can tell by the tree ring growth when a tree was felled and so we know the tree was felled in 1706 consistent with early building practices this homestead was constructed in 1707 so that's a pretty pretty solid date and so we come in to our nice low ceiling. And again, we're in the 1707 side of the house. And I did clean for everyone today. So, <laughs> um, and this is considered to be an early uh, German vernacular architecture. You can see all these uh, articulated framing and chamfering and the wood here is all original. So 1707. Uh, and again, you know, sort of built into the side of the a bank here. Of course, Lincoln Drive wasn't always there. Um, Lincoln Drive went in in what, like 1920 or so? Mm -hmm. 1913, something like that. And then now we walk in, you can see too, we take a little step up and we walk into the 1730 portion of the house, which is, you know, higher ceilings, a little area. We have a lot of the early paper making products in here, which wouldn't have typically been in this room. Um, but you can see this is an early press, which they would have pressed the paper with to get all the water out. And this is a vat where all the paper pulp would have been um, would have been sitting while they while the kutcher came in and made the paper. So again, still a lot of original details, even in the 1730 portion. When we walk up the stairs. So it started off as what a three-room house. Is that is that correct? And then it he expanded One, it. Two. Yeah, about that. Because there's this room up here, and then. Um, this little room off the side here, which you got me, uh, we're cleaning out our archives and reorganizing everything. So yeah, and these could have been partition walls. I mean, they, the, um, the configuration of the upper rooms could have changed over time. But again, all this original woodwork, which is just fantastic. And there you have Lincoln Drive. 
Wow. And I love to open this door <laughs> and show people the view from here. But this would have originally been the front entrance, which lets right out onto Lincoln Drive now. Oh, yeah. wow. Yep, with the steps. It's quiet now. Yeah. Not always this quiet. <laughs> Were there um, other, uh, at the time when it was built in the 1720s, they're in that vicinity of when these structures are getting expanded. Was there a lot of people in the general vicinity or were you talking like these guys were sort of deep in the woods? Well, there was a German town, which wasn't far. Um, and then, you know, it starts to kind of grow up around here. This is really one of the first little industrial villages. Um, the structures that you see here today, uh, while they're some of the oldest, they are, were not the only ones. Things were starting to Yeah, it would have still been remote. Um, but the reason that the Rittenhouse family settled here, not only because of the flax being grown in Germantown, but because of the creek. Um, and, it, mm -hmm. you know, you look at it now, and it's, it's not a huge creek, and you can wonder how it, how it powered a, a water wheel. Um, but when it rains, that creek goes pretty fast. And fast yeah. enough that even, you know, back then the first wheel was washed out with the flash flood. Um, so really, the, the village kind of grows up around the Rittenhouse family and what they're doing here. Um, mm -hmm. This was not, so the mill, it's, there was, I think, maybe up to three mills on site at one point. Um, textile, hosiery, paper. Uh, and so it was really just, it was a, a working industrial village. Well, kind of one of the first industrial villages in the area. No need. Industrial early enough that by, so 1890, it's basically obsolete. Mm -hmm. And that's when the entire site goes over to um, the Fairmont Park Commission. Oh, I see. So, and, yeah. Go ahead. So, so was that also, was that when the Fairmount Park Commission bought that, was that part of that whole thing where they were buying up mills along the, the creek there to sort of, as part of like an environmental cleanup sort of thing? Was that part of that or is that something else that, I'm thinking? That of? was the goal. Yeah, that certainly was the goal for the Fairmount to clean out the, the water source. Um, okay. Unfortunately, the water's still not in great shape around here today. <laughs> um, but this is our, uh, this is our, we call this our David room, uh, because it's got the exhibit on, on David Rittenhouse. Uh, David Rittenhouse was third generation Rittenhouse, and he was born here on site, but he didn't live here for very long. His father um, was pretty low down on the pecking order, so he didn't really stand to inherit a ton of land around here. It would, it would always go to the first born sons. Um, and David was, was sick as a little boy, so they moved uh, to a farm in Norton. But nonetheless, he was born here, which is significant, and so we have this, um, we have a timeline of his life. And for most people, you know, they don't even realize Rittenhouse Square is named after David Rittenhouse or the connection between Rittenhouse Town and Rittenhouse Square. Uh, but David was a clockmaker. This is one of his clocks that we have. Um, he was an astronomer. Uh, he was a surveyor. He was the first president of the U.S. Mint. Um, so he had a pretty prestigious life. And um, all this is, is about is the exhibit on David. Mm. So. Um, and then again, all these, like these stairs, I love this staircase. The staircase is all original. I don't know how well you can see the details. It's kind of dark in here now. Yeah. Wow, that is neat. Yeah, a great little. And then, you know, all these, uh, all these old built-ins. So, you know, underneath the stairs. Yeah, space was at a premium. <laughs> space was at a premium, right. So there's hooks and everything there. But we can head over to the bakehouse. Oh, sure. Oh, first, before we do, I know you mentioned uh, the hearth was an interesting uh, location. You said this is 16 and a half foot hearth, that's correct? That's where we're going. Oh, oh, that's it. Okay, I'm getting ahead of us. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> so it's, a, it's an entire house dedicated to baking and cooking. Um, but it's really kind of, it's one of my favorite parts of this whole, of the whole village is the bakehouse. So we'll head back outside. And then again, for people that have been through, it's this building right here, just adjacent to the homestead. And you said that was 1725 when this was built. 1730, we think this was built at the same time they put the addition on. Okay. And so we're going to go in. And I wish you could be here in person because you could smell it. It smells so good. Mm. Um, but that's it. A 16-foot hearth. <laughs> Look at 
Yeah, does it, and so does it, what does it smell like? Bread in there or what's the, what It just kinda... smells like a campfire. It smells like oh, fire. So we, oh. we still use it. We still have, um, we have a cook will come in and she'll do, we had her, we had a happy hour here in um, December and she made little donuts and potato shooters and pretzels. Um, so we still burn fires in here. It's, it's amazing. It's one of the best and amenities I think that this place has. And that's something you had started up was the, the happy hours. Uh, and yeah, the fire had, had happy hours. Down. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're going to have them. We're gonna, they're going to come back as soon as we can. Um, again, it's a small room, and there's no electricity in here. <laughs> oh. So you get a 360 view of the bakehouse here. I see a ladder there. Is there what, what's above you? Um, the attic, which we think was probably, I can start walking up here, probably use it, uh, for storage and stuff. We're not, uh, you know, not a hundred percent sure, but this is what we have up here now. And you can see kind of the massive, uh, stonework that sits on top of the fire, the, mm -hmm. on top of the 16 foot heart there. We can actually walk into the fireplace too. I like to, I had, um, someone just walk in there today, actually, because I tell everyone to come sit, you got to go stand in there. <laughs> but yeah um, it means uh we yeah and then over here is the beehive oven so i don't know if you can see in there so what they would have done is they would have started a fire down here put the live coals everything into the fireplace get it to a to a temperature where they can bake in it and then they would basically have this building going year round baking stuff and cooking for the village. Hmm. Would the fire, uh, would they be using the fire for uh, heating water and things like that as well? Or is that done somewhere else? Yeah, no, there's no reason why they couldn't have been doing that here as well. Um, yeah. And it's funny when we did our, when we did our happy hour in December, it was, it was so cold in here. We actually had to come a day in advance to start a fire so that the stones would retain some of the heat so that the next day it didn't take so long. But they wouldn't have had that problem because they just would have been cooking in it all all year round all the time yeah so, yeah, so. with the happy hours then the aim is to have those come back in the fall if things are oh absolutely as soon as we can i'm do we'll do it again okay yeah it sounds like a great time i mean what a what a good idea well and it was it was kind of one of the first things when i came here and we had um we had a little party and we had a fire going in here and i think it was september and it was just it was so nice it's like it's so cozy it's so it's just lovely and so we had uh, like i said we had someone here cooking so we had lots of treats and then of course we had some uh libations as well and it was just a, a lovely night did you do any partnering with like say local breweries or is there an idea to do maybe that uh, i would love to do that um we didn't for this one um, but going forward i've had some conversations with the folks at attic brewery um so i'd love to work with them when we do we also do um a drink history event, uh, which is basically a beer garden event. We have it up at our barn. Uh, and for that, we partnered with, with um, what was it? It was East Falls Beer Garden. Okay. Yeah, so, I know that so we just, we interviewed Todd and Laura Lacey from Attic. And Todd, obviously, with the whole Attic thing, he has a, a real love of history. So I know that some of his brews were based on, like, looking into the historical record on some of them. So you might, there might be a nice connection there. Yeah, yeah, they've been out once, but again, it's everything. So who knows these days, right? They it's were all up before, in the air uh, before everything changed. So, but hopefully they'll they'll come back and we'll be able to partner for a beer garden event um, yeah. as soon as we can. I mean, we're in the we're again in this unique position where we've got these buildings um, where you couldn't fit a hundred people on them even if you wanted to, and we've got all this open space. So um, we're talking about doing some open air lectures. Um, once, once we can doing some kind of social distancing beer garden stuff and, and, you know, as, as soon as we can open up for tours, we'll get people back in these buildings, you know, they come with families and it would be like, whoever you come with, you just take a quick tour of the building. But again, it's just a shame. So many people have come through here and have never been in these, these amazing buildings. And again, this is only two of the buildings that we have here on site. So I'm mm -hmm. just going to, um, reverse the camera again. Um, that white building up at the top, I don't know, is that in the screen? Mm -hmm. That's yes, one of our is. buildings, too, that gets rented out. Um, we have our offices, which is uh, the 
208 where you can see the office sign door and then the barn is where we do all of our educational and paper making programs and I understand that you're able to, you've been doing a sort of a loaner paper projects where you can do paper making at home, correct? Yeah, so we go out to a lot of like um, the, what is it, the battle, battle day in Germantown and different festivals and we'll set up a paper making table. And it's one of those things, people just love it. And it's really not hard to do. So while everyone's quarantining at home, we figured, you know, we, we have all these molds and decals more, you know, more than anybody needs. So why don't we loan them out and, and get people to make paper at home? Because it's, it's actually a lot of fun. It's a great art project. And there's just so much you can do with paper. <laughs> and there's a video on your website about how yep. to make it. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Surprisingly easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's something to do while everyone's at home. Uh, right. Anything else you want to tell us about coming up or any other big plans? Um, no, we're still kind of working on, on, you know, what's next for us when we can reopen, but we fully intend to be, have doors wide open as soon as it's safe to. Uh, we also have a coffee shop that just opened up on site. It's, uh, in our barn. Uh, so we do the paper making on one side and then it's the paper trail cafe is on this, the, the little tiny section, but he has signs out and a flag and he's open. Um, I think right now he's, he's Friday, Saturday and Sunday. But we'll look to expand the hours, you know, once the once the weather gets nice. And so he's making coffee, and then also doing any kind of bike tune-ups or anything that you need and custom build bikes. Wow, that is a great idea. Yeah. So maybe next time we can take a walk up there and, and show you that. Let's plan on doing that. Uh, yeah, the you can last... see the. I was gonna say you can see the paper making studio and the coffee shop. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is this uh, pop-up donation location. That yeah, there's so many people out here using our site. Um, it's attracting all the local neighborhood community people. We just thought a, a nice way to uh, help engage with people that are using our site is to put out um, pantry goods. I put some paper towels in there, um, pasta, you know, anything that you have in your pantry. And then if you're coming through the site and you know that you're visiting the Wissahickon and you've got some extra things that you can drop off, great or if you're you know just walking through and you know short on something feel free to pick something up hmm, so that's great what a good idea and uh yeah well i, I appreciate you making time for us today and giving no, us the thank tour. you yeah it was, it was nice to pleasure. finally get it was nice to finally get inside <laughs> there well Perfect. nothing's like the real thing so as soon as uh, as soon as it's safe i expect to see you here in person <laughs> okay thanks again amy we appreciate thank it you. once again amy Ricci with historic written you take care you too. Thanks so much. Bye-bye now. Bye.